Hello, welcome back to my channel. In this episode, I'll be discussing Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger, a 1977 fantasy film directed by Sam Wanamaker, with special effects by Ray Harryhausen, starring Patrick Wayne as Sinbad, Jane Seymour as Farrar, Taryn Power as Dione, Margaret Whiting as Zenobia, and Patrick Troughton as Gandalf. I mean, Melanthius. This is the third and final film in the Columbia Pictures Sinbad trilogy, and my personal favourite, although I may be the only member of that particular club. The story by Ray Harryhausen and Beverly Cross, based loosely on Sinbad the Sailor from 1001 Nights, begins with the aborted coronation of Prince Cassim, who is cursed by his evil stepmother Zenobia, who turns him into a baboon. If he remains in this form for more than seven moons, Zenobia's son will inherit the throne by default. Shortly thereafter, Sinbad arrives in port, with the intention of asking his old friend Cassim for his sister Farrar's hand in marriage. Farrar immediately throws herself at Sinbad's mercy, begging him to help lift the curse on her brother. So Sinbad, Farrar, Cassim the baboon and a motley crew of sailors set off for the mythical island of Kaskar, where they hope to enlist the aid of a legendary Greek alchemist named Melanthius. They discover Melanthius and his daughter Dione living in an impressively sized temple which bears a striking resemblance to Petra in Jordan, although based on the appalling blue screen travelling mat shots used throughout the film, I suspect only their second unit doubles ever got to see it. Melanthius, played with Panache by Patrick Troughton, spends a little time testing the veracity of their tale, examining the baboon to determine if he is in truth a cursed prince, but once that's out of the way he quickly comes on board, and immediately formulates a plan to seek out the land of Hyperborea, that's a real place by the way, where the ancient civilization of the Arimaspi once existed. Luckily he has a map conveniently close by, and also a key to the ancient temple where he believes they can lift the curse. So, with two new members on the team, the expedition sets off on a long voyage to the distant north. Along the way they have various adventures, and fight some oversized creatures, including a giant bee, which for some reason they incorrectly identify as a mosquito, and a giant sabre-toothed turd, which I think was supposed to be a walrus, but it looks like a turd and is definitely not Harryhausen's best work. In fact, after the film's release, which unfortunately coincided with the release of Star Wars, Harryhausen was criticised for his efforts on Sinbad, and he admitted that his work on this film had been rushed. Personally, I don't think it's that bad. The earlier creatures aren't great, and the walrus is frankly terrible, but the baboon, which features as a main character throughout the film, and must have consumed most of Harryhausen's time, is really quite excellent, giving a nuanced and emotionally moving performance. And once Sinbad and his crew arrive at Hyperborea, the creatures become really good we're treated to an Eden-like bathing scene, which I kindly recreated at the beginning of this review, you're welcome, in which Dione and Farrar meet a troglodyte, who turns out to be both friendly and very useful later on. This is one of Harryhausen's more successful creations, and one of my personal favourites. The 18-inch puppet was sufficiently detailed that it could withstand extreme facial close-ups, and Harryhausen imbued it with a great deal of character. Enough that the audience genuinely cared about him, and hoped nothing bad would happen to him. 
Trog, as he is affectionately named, leads the expedition to the Temple of the Aramaspi, which is a giant pyramid with a column of swirling energy pouring down from the Aurora Borealis through its tip into the shrine within. This column of light was actually made out of multiple strands of dental floss, filmed out of focus with pretty lighting effects. True story. Here, the expedition is confronted by Zenobia, who got there first, and there's a brief scuffle in which Cassim the baboon kills Zenobia's son, and while she's distractedly cradling her son's corpse, Cassim is quickly passed through the column of light. I say quickly, actually the whole thing happens far too slowly and very ponderously, if you consider the fact that the temple is crumbling all around them and its power source is failing. However, despite the lack of urgency, Kasim returns from the Column of Light, engulfed in a small cloud of dry ice, and returned to his human form. Enraged, Zenobia does that thing with her eyes, which I presume gives the film its title, and turns into a waft of farty-looking green smoke, which quickly ensouls and thaws a nearby deep-frozen saber-toothed tiger. Here, Harryhausen clearly devoted a large portion of his limited time, because the fight between the big cat and the troglodyte is beautifully choreographed and animated, and is definitely among the best such fight scenes that Harryhausen produced. This is a vicious battle, with Trog taking heavy damage from those lethal teeth, and also raking claws which draw blood. The detail of the animation and the fact that it's decently lit and well integrated into the live action set makes this fight genuinely tense for the viewer, or at least it did for this particular viewer back in the late 1970s, and the outcome of the battle genuinely moved me. And then, while the audience is still catching its breath, the film crashes clumsily and unceremoniously into the end credits, over the final scenes of Cassim's coronation. It's like when live TV overruns and they begin playing the credits while the programme is still in full swing. Overall, I must admit that this film is far shoddier and more clunky than I tend to remember it. I first saw it when I was very young, and I adored it. I was an innocent viewer with an open mind unsullied by cinematic sophistication. It was, for me, a magical story, filled with fantastical creatures who seemed totally believable at the time, and heroic characters. I didn't notice that John Wayne's son was a terrible actor, or that Tyrone Power's daughter was rather odd and awkward, and I wasn't offended by the excruciatingly bad dialogue or the grainy and rushed optical effects. I just loved the movie, and I've carried it in my heart ever since. My affection for this clunky, old-fashioned piece of cinematic history remains undiminished, despite having watched it last night, struggling not to doze off. Yes, it's mostly bad by modern standards. The script is awful and the acting is across the board atrocious, with the notable exception of Patrick Troughton, who's superb. And the visuals are unimpressive to modern eyes. But here's the thing. I don't have modern eyes. My eyes were made in the early 1970s, and they still love this shit. That's not to say that they can't fully appreciate the best that modern CGI has to offer. They can, but unlike millennial eyes, my ones were built with special nostalgia filters, which allows me to look back with fondness. Aren't I lucky? And on that note, I think I'll call it a day. Thank you very, very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, you know what to do. Please hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and I will see you next time. See you later.